talked about ECMO earlier, and we had a bit of a philosophical talk, and now we're back to a more uh, practical at the bedside talk. And you might have said, oh, that ECMO sounds great, but we don't do ECMO in my center. So while you, what, what am I supposed to do? Well, so now we're going to talk about how you, while you're waiting for the ECMO team to show up, or, or maybe to see if you can avoid getting the patient into the window where they need ECMO, we'll talk about uh, treating refractory hypoxemia without a circuit. Um, and I think it's, it's useful to think about this around a clinical case, because these are cases that we see not infrequently. You know, most patients, once you get them intubated and onto a ventilator, are not so difficult to, uh, to auctionate. Peep of 10, 50% auction, everything's okay. But there are certainly a minor, an important minority of patients who still have significant uh, hypoxemia despite a moderate amount of PEEP and are, and are on 80, 90, or even 100% oxygen to keep their SATs up. So consider this 36-year-old woman who's been intubated for a couple of days for pneumonia. Um, and these are her ventilator settings. She's on uh, pressure control ventilation with a driving pressure of 20. Uh, PEEP is 12, getting uh, tidal volumes of just over 6 mils per kilogram. She's on 90% oxygen, and the PO2 is only 80. PCO2 is 58. So what should we do? What, what should we do now, or what what test should we do to figure out what to do next? For me, I'll tell you what I I do something simple. Obviously, you're going to do lots of tests, but one key thing that takes me down different pathways is thinking about what the chest X-ray looks like in this situation. Does the chest X-ray look like this? where you project really well, but you can see it's relatively black. And you're thinking, huh, I, I, I expected the x-ray to be whiter than that. Or does the x-ray look like you kind of expected when I was telling you the patient had pneumonia and ARDS and looks like that x-ray uh, on the left. So I'm going to spend the rest of the talk focusing on the x-ray on the right, but it's important before you go down that pathway to make sure that the, the patient doesn't have one of these left-hand x-rays. Why might that patient have really bad hypoxemia? Maybe they have non-pulmonary shunting, intracardiac shunt, uh, they might have a, or they might have ABM, uh, uh, sort of uh, arterial venous malformations in their, uh, in their lung portal uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome. They might have had a pulmonary embolus, they might just be profoundly under-resuscitated, and when you're applying positive pressure, you've decreased their cardiac output, and they're only able to ventilate uh, parts of their lung that aren't, uh, that aren't very open. But anyway, those are, again, a minority of a, mi of a minority. Most of the patients who are difficult to oxygenate have ARDS and have x-rays that look like this. And here, as Phil already showed us, we recognize that although the x-ray looks like there's bad disease everywhere, the truth is, most of the time, we have quite a heterogeneous looking lung. And so I use this simple schema at the bedside still, realizing that most of the time, although there are different, re different physiological reasons for being hypoxemic, we've, we've already corrected and taken care of most of them. So most of the time in ARDS patients, they're hypoxemic because of some combination of ventilation, perfusion, mismatch or its extreme shunt. So, and then coupling that knowledge with what we know the CT scan looks like, we want to do things that are going to improve blood flow to areas of the lung that are already receiving gas, and or at the same time, try to open up this collapsed and atelectatic lung which is already receiving blood flow to some extent because of gravity. So up here, we could give fluid, try to improve the cardiac uh, output with inotropes. We would avoid uh, dynamic hyperinflation or extra positive pressure. We could give inhaled nitric oxide, and prone positioning might help a little bit here. And on the other side, we can think about using higher levels of PEEP, recruitment maneuvers, alternative modes of ventilation, prone positioning probably has its major effect actually in the recruitment of uh, 
posterior basal lung units. So let's go through some of the data about this. Even before we get down to this list, the first thing many of us would do would be to resuscitate, sedate, and often paralyze the patients. Um, we even felt good about doing this for, uh, for some time based on the accuracy uh, trial from uh, Laurent Papazian and colleagues showing a significant improvement in mortality with a short 48-hour course of uh, neuromuscular blockers. Many of you will be aware that recently there's new data about this from the same pedal network that was just mentioned. Uh, the ROSE, it's the, because it's the pedal network, pedal is uh, an acronym for uh, prevention and early treatment of acute lung injury, but that's also the, the uh, part of a flower. So all the trials that are coming out of, uh, out of the pedal network have flower uh, names. So this is the ROSE trial, um, which, look, which tried to replicate some of the uh, accurate trial findings. It used the same high-dose, uh, non-adjusted 37.5 milligrams an hour dose of cisatricurium. Um, but some key differences were that it was compared to targeted lighter sedation, which was felt to be more in standard practice at the time, and the other major difference is that there was a higher PEEP used in both groups in this uh, trial. And because it was part of this early treatment uh, network, patients were recruited both from the intensive care unit, but also very shortly after intubation in the emergency department. Get more on that in a second. You can see here that there was no... Oops. Sorry. This doesn't... Uh, show up as well. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve, which, as you can see here, shows no difference in the primary outcome of 60-day mortality, or 90-day mortality, excuse me. Low use of prone positioning in both groups. They did have a, an experiment in terms of uh, differences in the amount of paralysis used between groups and the actual sedation level achieved. Remember we were talking about that uh, registry trial where almost everybody got into the trial? Not so much here. They had, um, they screened almost 5,000 patients. 655 were excluded because a clinician had already put them on a neuromuscular blocker. So that's a problem because maybe those patients are the ones that clinicians were most concerned about and might have, maybe might have benefited most and now they're out of the trial. They ended up randomizing only about one in five of the patients who were assessed. And then, this is another interesting thing. They were randomized within seven or eight hours of being intubated. And initially, they looked really sick. Their PF ratio is under 100 here, 90, 98, 99, which is really low for a, uh, for a ARDS trial where uh, the inclusion criteria was a PF ratio of less than 150. But something very interesting happened. If you go to the online supplement and look at what, what goes on, this is PF ratio and PEEP levels over the first week of ventilation. Here's their baseline level. And by day one, their PF ratio is almost 200 in both groups with no incremental change in PEEP. So how'd that happen? Just for contrast, I'll show you the control arm from the oscillate trial, which basically had the same PEEP strategy and the same uh, ventilation strategy here. They were actually, their PF ratio was a little higher at baseline, but by day one was still under 150 and didn't get over 200 until day seven. And that was despite a large increase in PEEP in the, uh, in the oscillate trial. So why, this, why are these results different between accuracies and, uh, and, and rows? Maybe the higher PEEP and the lighter sedation comparator had some, uh, something to do with it. Patients were heavily sedated in the French trial because they were trying to blind. That could have unintentionally led to, to paradoxically, more um, dyssynchrony by inducing reverse triggering, which can, uh, which can happen more under deep sedation. They had much less use of proning in this trial, and maybe there's an interaction between neuromuscular blockade and prone positioning. But I also think that they 
that the Rose trial included a bunch of patients who looked sick initially, but who really weren't persistently, really didn't have really RDS, and by day one, really had improved a lot. Um, and so this, we're often talking about, oh, we need to start early and get patients into trial and get patients uh, onto therapy. But sometimes I think you need to give the patient a bit of a window uh, to make sure that they really have a persistent uh, illness that you want to take care of. So moving on, let's talk about, so we got the patients sedated and paralyzed and uh, they're still hypoxemic. What to do next? I think the next thing is to think about titrating PEEP and plus or minus recruitment maneuvers. Here's the volume pressure curve of the lung. For sure, we want to avoid this zone of over-distension. We probably want to avoid this zone of derecruitment and atelectasis, maybe because opening and closing causes injury in and of itself, but probably even more importantly, because the more atelectasis you have, the smaller the size of that baby lung, and the more over-distension those alveoli are, are going to have. So where to set PEEP and how to open the lung. We used to talk about setting PEEP down here around the lower inflection point. We thought, oh, that'll keep the lung open. But in CT scan, and you can see here that that's not where the lung is open, that's where the lung starts to open. And it continues opening until you get to the upper inflection point. If, you're, if your patient's dying of refractory hypoxemia, I put it to you that a brief recruitment maneuver trying to get that patient up and over onto the deflation limb of the volume uh, pressure curve Certainly may be, inf may be effective. This is a systematic review that uh, Eddie Fan led uh, several years ago, showing that if you're, if you're mostly interested in improving oxygenation because your patient's dying of hypoxemia, recruitment maneuvers, and these are mostly uh, short, sustained inflation maneuvers, 30 centimeters of water for 30 seconds, 40 by 40, um, have a pretty good effect on your PF ratio. And more recently, we've been enthralled by these uh, super Brazilian uh, staircase recruitment maneuvers, um, as uh, outlined here in the ARCH trial, where they, they go on pressure control, PEEP is 25, then 30, then 45, followed by a decremental PEEP trial, and then one more sustained inflation and back to where you thought your best PEEP was. This is very good at opening up the lung. Whether it's actually good for patients, we don't know, or we have some questions. So they did this uh, large trial in, uh, in a multi-center trial in, Bra in Brazil, and th at the end of the trial, we saw, in fact, a higher mortality in the staircase higher PEEP arm. A few caveats about this. Um, Brazilians love PEEP, so even in the control arm, patient, uh, clinicians were using higher PEEP than was recommended. And there were, several, there were several patients who actually had cardiac arrest at the time of their recruitment maneuver because they were very uh, prolonged. It comes with very little uh, ventilation. pH can fall below 7. And the right heart can be extremely unhappy. This is not isolated, but the art, so the art study is saying, oh, let's be careful about those aggressive recruitment maneuvers. There are other, a couple of other trials which, have been, which are finished using very similar methodology, which uh, have not shown that uh, harm signal. This is the, uh, a study by, by Bob Kazmarek and Jesus Vilar, open lung approach, almost the same kind of methodology, showing that's you know, 22 versus 27% mortality, favoring the open lung approach. No harm signal here. And similarly, the Australians had first a, a pilot study showing improvements in inflammatory markers, and then a a trial which has been uh, stopped and it's not published yet. I found this, uh, it's been presented at meetings. I found this slide on Twitter, so it's in the public domain, um, showing no difference in mortality, but again, no, uh, no harm signal there. We have other data as well from higher PEEP trials. This is the data from uh, Maureen Mead's uh, lung open ventilation study showing a strategy of recruitment maneuvers, sustained inflation maneuvers, plus higher PEEP certainly led to fewer cases of refractory hypoxemia and less death from refractory hypoxemia as well. And, and although taken individually, the alveoli study, the EXPRESS trial, and the LOVES trial, higher versus lower PEEP, none of them was significant individually. When put together in an individual patient data meta-analysis and separated between 
moderate to severe ARDS versus mild ARDS, we now see a statistically significant improvement with higher PEEP in sicker patients. And why is, does that make sense? Well, the first thing you have to think about is why I want to know what the x-ray looked like. Before you start trying to recruit the lung, you better be sure that there's some lung that needs recruiting, right? This is uh, uh, Lieutenant Gattinoni's paper in the New England Journal hmm, 13 years ago now, showing what happens when you try to do sustained inflation maneuvers on, on patients. There's variability. Here's a, an example of a highly recruitable patient. It's great, five centimeter water, 45. Oxygenation way better. Everybody's patting themselves on the back on a good bunch of doctors we are. Here's a not very recruitable patient. So two important things to notice here. First of all, look at the starting CT scan. It doesn't look that different from the finishing CT scan of our previous patient. The other thing to notice is look at the heart. Here's the heart at five. Here's the heart on 45. Right? That didn't happen in the other patient so much. So when, you're, when you apply high pressure and don't achieve recruitment, you only cause badness. So again, that's a way of saying that we need to individualize our approach to recruitment and, uh, and PEEP. How could we individualize? Well, there's very, you might have used the express trial method, which was put PEEP as high as you can while still maintaining a plateau but below 30. You might use a stress index. You might use an esophageal balloon. If you actually wanted to use higher PEEP on patients who are more recruitable, then it turns out the best way to do that is using the PEEP FIO2 table. Much to Dr. Gantanoni's chagrin, I imagine. Um, and this is the, the nice thing about this is you can also try it and see what happens. PEEP is very fast acting. This is analysis, uh, an analysis that uh, Ewan Gallagher did using the lung open ventilation study data. And he just looked at, so patients, when they went onto the trial, some of them had their, depending on both what their baseline setting of PEEP was and which group they were randomized to, they either had their PEEP raised or, or not. It was either, or it, it might have stayed the same or gone down. So he split those patients into two groups. Those who had their PEEP went up and those who didn't. And then he looked to see what happened to their oxygenation at the first available blood gas on study, which is on average about a couple of hours afterwards. There's a strong relationship with mortality in people who had a PEEP increase with oxygenation. If your PF ratio went up after your PEEP went up, you had a much lower chance of dying. Conversely, if, if your PEEP went up and your oxygenation got worse, you had a much higher chance of dying. And reassuringly, we didn't see any relationship with the PEEP that was the same or, uh, or lower. So again, recruitment may be useful, especially if it's, and if it actually works, even better. PEEP and recruitment maneuvers debates are not new and they'll continue. I think we should be careful about these maximal uh, staircase type of recruitment maneuvers, especially if they're taking a long time and, and are causing significant hemodynamic embarrassment. But overall, lung, 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 lung recruitment probably is a good thing if it's actually achieved. So we've got our patient so far sedated, paralyzed. PEEP has been titrated. They've been resuscitated. What about prone positioning? Many people get inert. We get calls all the time. Uh, can you come put this patient on ECMO? And I said, oh, have you put the patient, has the patient been prone yet? Said, oh, we don't do that here. Why not? Uh, we're nerv or we're nervous because the patient's on 100% oxygen and we're, we're worried that they're going to desaturate when they, uh, when they go prone. And, you know, fair enough, we can be nervous about that. But the, but the truth is that we've known even, these are data from the first uh, prone positioning trial in the New England Journal in 2001, showing that every time you put a patient prone, their PF ratio gets better. Yes, there may be a little bit of rockiness for a few minutes, but if you can ride that out, um, Prone positioning is a good way of uh, improving oxygenation. Not only that, probably saves lives too. This, these are, this is a nice story of subgroup analyses and PF, patients with a PF ratio less than 100, um, showing significant uh, difference, and then followed by a prospective confirmatory trial in, uh, in Proceva. So we should be thinking about this in, in all of our ARDS patients with a PF ratio less than 150. But especially in those who are, who are really sick, think about uh, prone positioning.
Um, other rescue therapies we might think about, inhaled nitric oxide, uh, great physiology, uh, and a selectively selective pulmonary vasodilator that goes only where, uh, where the air is going. If you're trying to think about back to our improving VQ mismatching, that's great. And it actually works at improving oxygenation in many patients. So it's, it's something that you might use to buy time. Unlike uh, prone positioning, it does not improve mortality. If anything, there's some concern that all of these estimates are slightly on the wrong side of this, uh, of this line here. Um, novel modes or different modes of, mental, of mechanical ventilation to, uh, to improve oxygenation. Airway pressure release ventilation or bi-level. Um, who likes that? Uh, anybody, any APRV fans here? You? Okay. Generally, this is a mode that's loved by uh, Germans and American trauma surgeons. Those are the people that seem, the, the data would seem to suggest that. But uh, this is two levels of PEEP, essentially. Two levels of CPAP, where the patient is able to breathe spontaneously uh, in between. And, um, and then there's intermittent releases to help with ventilation. This can be set up in many different ways, but... This is the sort of typical North American trauma surgeon way of doing it with a long time at the high CPAP and a short release to, uh, to help with ventilation. And people who love APRV say it's great. Um, you can deliver a high mean airway pressure and recruit the lung and improve oxygenation. And it also facilitates spontaneous breathing. That might help with hemodynamics and venous return. You don't really have to worry about synchrony because it's just CPAP. Um, and they're gonna still be using their diaphragm, that's great. I still have some worries with APRV though. I worry about overstretch with release volumes because if you set your CPAP of your low level at zero, you're gonna have release volumes of a, a liter. And even if that's only happening 10 times a minute, that might be a problem. I also worry a lot about, over, about um, overstretch with spontaneous breaths. You're holding the patient at a plateau, a, C, a CPAP of 30, for example, and they're breathing above that, their, their transpulmonary pressure could be very high. You also get the recruitment with uh, releases, and the RV may be quite unhappy with this prolonged high, uh, high pressure. I'd summarize by saying lots of enthusiasm, little clinical uh, or experimental data. Until recently, most of these things uh, were small trials like this, which showed no difference in clinical outcomes. There is one positive trial that's been published in intensive care medicine a couple of years ago, um, a small single center study from China, 150-ish uh, patients, showing Improvements in the, the number of fewer days of ventilation, more ventilator-free days. But there are some baseline differences uh, favoring the APRV group. Um, tidal volumes were a little higher, deeper sedation in the other group. So this is still hypothesis generating and not ready for, for prime time in my, in my books. What about high-frequency oscillation as a mode to, uh, to improve oxygenation? This works essentially HFO works as CPAP. You're allowed to put a very, and you can put a higher level of PEEP than you would otherwise. And then you shake the patient to magically get rid of CO2. That's, how, that's, the, uh, that's the unofficial, uh, the short answer version. And we used to love HFO a lot. Um, when we started using this in the 90s, we took patients who were dying of hypoxemia, we put them on HFO and they survived. So great. And, and then we started thinking about, oh, there's all sorts of, potential for uh, good enhanced lung protection here. And we went on and a couple of large trials were done, one of which, our Canadian trial, actually showed a increase in mortality in the HFO group. And so right after this, suddenly, everybody put the oscillators in the cupboard and they hadn't been seen, uh, hadn't been seen since. But I'm here to tell you that you can still use HFO as a rescue therapy. When we looked at this, when we combined the data from, all, from both of those two trials and a couple previous, turns out there's a strong effect modification according to the degree of baseline hypoxemia. Let me just take you through this here. So in patients whose PF ratio at baseline was above 100, the odds ratio was above one, which means that HFO was killing people. But when the PF ratio at baseline was below 100, or if you want to be a little bit more conservative, and take the whole 95% confidence interval around the baseline PF ratio below 61, then actually there's a strong signal for benefit for HFO in these patients, which to me says, well, so we still use HFO occasionally in patients who are really difficult to oxygenate and who we don't want to put on ECMO for some reason. Again, I showed this slide uh, 
earlier this morning. We've gone from here to here. I think ECMO's here. HFO, I put in a, in a purple thing, and they're saying, no, there's some mixed data, and you might use it in special uh, circumstances. And I still think that this algorithm is, is fairly good for getting us through most patients with uh, refractory hypoxemia. Treat the underlying cause, titrate your, uh, your PEEP, prone positioning, neuromuscular blockade, and higher PEEP, then think about inhaled pulmonary vasodilators, recruit maneuvers, call your ECMO center around this time after you have the patient uh, in the prone position. Thank you very much. Thank you.